Hey everyone, you're tuned into the Founder Hour podcast. I'm your co-host Pat, and today on the show we sit down with Tracy Denunzio. Tracy is the founder and CEO of Tradesy, the largest online resale marketplace for buying and selling luxury designer fashion. Their mission is to make the world's most wanted fashion brands accessible and sustainable. We spoke with Tracy all about her upbringing and early career, how she came up with the idea for Tradesy, her thoughts on the future of the fashion industry and sustainability, and much more. Here we go. I grew up in the suburbs outside of New York um, as an only child. I was very creative, super artistic. I thought I wanted to grow up to be a famous painter. Um, and I admired Frida Kahlo and wanted to live a life like hers. Um, and I read a lot. I was really, really curious, like insatiably curious and in a very big hurry to grow up. How did you get into like art I mean was it some sort of like innate talent you had that is unexplainable or was there like a moment or time where you realized you know this is what I want to do I, I would I would like to think I had an innate and unexplainable talent I don't know if it's true um, I was I was good at drawing though and I loved 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 doing it it was um, it was just a super peaceful thing for me that I would get very absorbed in like maybe what we call a flow state. And, um, and I was really interested in people. So from a young age, I was drawing people and portraits and was pretty good at capturing a likeness. Um, I really liked to study a person's lines and angles as a way of kind of getting to know them, know them and understand them. You know, it's so funny because I, I was the very much the same way as a kid. I, I love drawing and I love drawing people. So anytime we had like family over or gatherings, I would be the person in the corner on the table and one by one, the family would come and I would draw their faces and they, you know, they would put it on their fridge or something. And I loved it. And then at some point, you know, my mom put me in like class, like art class. And, and at that moment I lost interest for some oh. reason it just because i i don't know if it was a, a patience thing or what it was but i just loved just doing my own thing granted i wasn't like the best at it if you look at it like aesthetically but uh you know i was okay and 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 i think that as soon as there's some structure introduced i kind of lost that um passion for it in a way i don't know for you though like was it something that you you know you saw that you were good at it and people were telling you Hey, Tracy, like you're really good at this and, you know, you, you decided to pr perhaps pursue it and take classes and get better at it. And how was that for you? Well, I had the same um, problem with authority. So I didn't, I didn't really like being taught anything, uh, including art. And I did, but I liked going to art classes and art schools on the weekend for the, for the opportunity to just do it. Um, but I did also always kind of question authority and not really believe that anyone could teach, especially art, right? There's no such thing as being good at it or bad at it. And it's very hard to teach the things that create like high quality or interesting or compelling art. Um, and I pursued it because my parents to, to their credit and also like in, you know, they, they weren't very focused on preparing me to make money. It wasn't really part of their uh, equation. They had both grown up very, very poor um, and kind of got to a, a like a middle class place. And they were very relaxed about wanting me to pursue whatever made me happy. Um, what, did, what did they do? So my dad was an accountant um, and then uh, later became a computer programmer, like an early database programmer. Um, and my mom was a secretary at a healthcare company. You know, you talk about your parents growing up uh, poor and then kind of, uh, you know, kind of elevating to the middle class status. Did you... Did you recognize or feel that when you were a kid? I mean, did you think of your family as poor or not as fortunate as perhaps the others that were around you? 
I was a little bit blissfully unaware of the idea of, you know, wealth and money and different classes and different people getting different lives. Um, and now I'm very aware of that. Uh, it's hard to be a person in 2021 and not see what's going on there. But um, as a younger person, I think I was just sort of uh, insulated from those things. I knew that my um, extended family lived in um, apartments and went to the laundromat instead of having a washer dryer in the basement like we had. And in that way, I felt like we were kind of the rich ones. Um, and um, But it wasn't, like money wasn't really a focus in my family. Um, wasn't a thing that was talked about or thought about that much. Yeah. And, and something that's interesting, I, I think like, you know, when kind of around the era when sort of we all grew up, um, you know, art, art, pursuing art was like frowned upon, right? Especially mm -hmm. with school is like, you're not going to make any money. You're not going to be successful. Like, why are you doing art? Go do this, go do that. I mean, those are the things that not just, I would hear like my family was pretty similar to yours, like pretty chill, but from friends, parents and other people. Right. And, yeah. and so did you ever, I know you you said your, your parents sort of let you sort of do what you wanted, but did you ever experience that? And was that ever a question for you? Cause I know you mentioned, or I, I think you ended up getting uh, a degree in art or going to school mm -hmm. for art, right? Um, was that ever something that you would hear? It didn't, I, I heard, I knew that other people's parents and, you know, other, other opinions in the world were that one should pursue a thing that they could make money at. But I was almost sort of, you know, from this school of thought when I was young of like, not wanting to sell out to the man and thinking that having money was um, not important at all. And so I was almost in opposition to the idea of doing activities in pursuit of money. It seemed like dirty to me. I was like, I'm going to be an artist. As I got older, what I realized was that because I didn't inherit a vast amount of wealth, that type of thinking was a luxury. And that, you know, um, the way I wanted to be able to live and the things that I felt like I needed to feel safe were going to be accessible to me through earning money. Um, and so I changed my mind a little bit about the virtues of pursuing wealth, um, at least to some degree. Um, but I didn't, I didn't really think about it until I got old enough to, I, I had bartended from the time I was very young, always made a bunch of cash. And I really didn't start thinking about like, what about making money to actually be truly secure until I was closer to like 30 before I started the business. What was your favorite cocktail to make? <laughs> oh gosh, it's been so long. I don't know. It was, you know, it was, it was the early 2000s in New York City and the late 90s. So it was a lot of vodka Red Bulls and it wasn't like a fan. Dirty. Yeah, <laughs> dirty martinis and late night nightclub things. And yeah. Yeah. How did you, how did you get into that? I mean, you just fall into that just as a way to make money or, or what was it? Yeah, so it was a very it was a very different era. Um, so when I was in high school, I worked as a hostess at a restaurant uh, in my hometown, and uh, like the bartender didn't show up one night, and they threw me in. And I was good at it, so I learned how to bartend before well before legal drinking age. Um, and once I started college, uh, I was always bartending to pay my bills and and cover my overhead. Um, and then when I moved to New York City to do art school, I got lucky uh, in that I met some people who ran the sort of very shishi types of nightclubs with the velvet ropes outside. And I got to um, work in those places where you, you could just make a lot of money. Um, and then And then even though I was an art student and I was fully self-supporting, I was actually doing all right because you make really good money in those places. I what's, wasn't too much, but hey. <laughs> what's one thing that was a takeaway for you from your time in, you know, bartending or hospitality in general? I mean, uh, were there any lessons you picked up that you had to apply later in life, whether personally or professionally? Yeah, tons. I mean, the first is the number one rule of life, like tip your waiter and don't be an asshole. That's important. Um, but um, yeah, I think I got comfortable dealing with um, powerful people um, 
because I was working around them and for them. Um, and, but in a, in a capacity that's kind of social, right? So I, and, and so in my growing up, I wasn't exposed to, you know, people who had money or fame or anything like that. And then through my job and through working, I was around those people and I got to see them, you know, get drunk and get their hearts broken and, you know, talk too much or too little and be people. And it taught me not to be too intimidated um, by someone's, you know, reputation or material success. Uh, And then later when I got the opportunity to meet with investors and important people to help support my business trajectory, I was probably some percent less nervous because of those Mm. experiences. So tell us a little bit about, I guess, art school and and what you learned there and and what did you end up doing immediately after that? Yeah, so art school was, um, you know, it was mostly about like learning about life. Um, And I had something, I I had something else unusual that throughout my childhood and then especially in college really affected my experience. Um, So I had, when I was born, I was born with something called spina bifida. It's a, like a birth defect of the spine. Um, Most people who have it are paralyzed um, and and unable or or not mobile or not fully mobile. And I was very lucky um, for a number of reasons. I was able to mostly stay on my feet. And so throughout my childhood, I had a few different operations and some medical attention. But during my college years, I actually ended up periodically having to take time off to have surgeries and having a few pretty significant health challenges that were like massive battles of the mind, body, and spirit. And so I was moving back and forth between um, a pretty cool life of studying art by day and bartending by night and then dipping out for three, four, five months at a time to have these very high-risk surgeries and go through recovery periods. Um, so it wasn't a typical college experience, uh, in any way. Um, but you know, plenty of life lessons and resiliency and ways to grow up super fast, having all of that kind of breadth of experience during those formative years. Yeah. I mean, that's insane. And and like, I mean, tell us a little bit about like what your mindset was like at the time. Like, how did you balance these two sort of lives, I guess, like between kind of just trying to be like, you know, a normal student and learn and and kind of go about things and then having to deal with this, um, these health issues. Like, how are you, what what was going through your head? Like what were things that you would maybe turn to as like resources or inspiration or just things to like kind of keep your head clear? Yeah. Well, Art was like, art was the thing, right? Being creative. And I put it all in a bucket. Like, I feel like the work I do now with my company is also art making. So I put it, I put it all in one bucket of work. Maybe not, you know, not the kind of work that you do when you're bartending, but creative work, like building, making things. Um, So all the way through all of it, I was always making art. And that was always sort of felt like my home base or my place to go to kind of settle in. Um, But then also just by being like a hot mess, like you would expect any 19 year old to be who's dealing with a lot of stuff. um, It was, it was difficult and I would definitely have to go through adjustment phases of moving back and forth. I was very determined. um, I was very determined. I had a lot of, um, I had a lot of fight in me and a sense that uh, I wasn't going to let the health stuff prevent me from pursuing my art stuff and that I wasn't going to miss out on my fun years either. And I was still going to go out and party with my friends too. And so I pushed hard um, to kind of live as much of life as I could because when you have experiences that threaten your health, it also kind of gives you a real sense of urgency to like enjoy the life when you have it. Um, so I'd say it was intense. Um, and I mostly turned to making art to be balanced at, or wasn't balanced. Yeah. <laughs> but- and what, what kind of art were you making around this time? Cause I didn't mention growing up, you were into like portraits and people, was that about the same stuff or was, did you kind of get into other things as, as you went through school? 
I got into other things. Um, so I went from like what they call figurative work, you know, painting and drawing real, like real life things in a representative way to exploring more abstract painting and like abstract forms of expression and even multimedia stuff. Um, and then towards the end of college, I got really interested in, um, so I, while I was going through all of these kind of surgeries and recovery periods, uh, I started making art that was based on photographs that my father had taken in Vietnam when he was in Vietnam. Um, and, um, and part of that was that the, the thing that I was born with, the, the spina bifida, it's related to Agent Orange, which he was exposed to in Vietnam. And so I became curious about that whole time in both his history and in American history and about learning about that, you know, why, why we used those chemicals and what impact they had on people. And I started doing art projects that were a little bit more rooted in reality storytelling and problem solving. Um, and the first one was this series of paintings that were based on my dad's photographs. And I did them uh, every time I would have surgery and I was recovering, I would work on them like kind of on the floor with a different technique. Um, and so that led to then I started really thinking about like doing um, documentary slash social activism type artwork that could draw attention to or educate people about things happening in the world. I love that. Is that, can, is, is that, is that something that we could like see anywhere on the internet or, or in person or do you, is, is it just in your house somewhere? Oh, it's a Google. There's a couple of them here in my closet. Um, and there was a website once that was terrible and it's no longer in existence. I don't think it's anywhere, um, but I could, I could take a photo and send it to you. <laughs> but that's, I don't know if, uh, I don't think they're anywhere now. Tracy, just for some perspective, what, year is this around when you are going through all these health challenges and graduating from art school what 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 year was this so yeah so i'm old now so this was um uh from like 1998 to 2001 Mm. so i was like 1920 ish around these years right and so you know you're doing some of this art stuff and going through these challenges i mean was there any idea in your head of, you know, a quote unquote career that you'd pursue? Never, ever, ever. I had no idea. I knew I wanted to do things that were really impactful. I, I cared about having some positive impact on the world um, a lot. That I, that felt like um, like it was important. But at the time, I didn't imagine a, like a quote unquote career or business career, uh, let alone. Um, I was interested in nonprofit work. I was interested in making art about social issues. I didn't, I didn't think about, you know, anything business related really at that time. So, so what did you do for the next few years? I left New York city and I went to Mexico (laughs) Um, and I spent almost four years getting a master's degree in fine art in Mexico and like recovering from all the surgeries, learning how to salsa dance, um, visiting Frida Kahlo's house, doing art exhibitions in Mexico city, learning the language, you know, seeing the world. Um, I spent sort of my mid twenties doing that. And then also, uh, I would, come back to New York and bartend during the summers and travel around a bit in Europe and South America. Um, I just really wanted to kind of see the whole world. So mm. I, I did a bit of that. You said it learned how to salsa dance. And I, and at first I heard, I learned how to sell sedans and I'm like, Whoa, that's a, <laughs> that's an odd job. <laughs> that would have been the weirdest. I, that, uh, I did not sell in a single sedan. <laughs> So I guess, uh, you know, as I mean, as your sort of career went on and like sort of later in your career, I mean, did you sort of have any like realizations of, you know, uh, you know, I'm kind of all over the place, but like, I kind of want to go down this particular path or what, did you still like envision your entire career and life would just be like, kind of just going around making art, doing whatever, whatever you felt like at the moment without any like sort of particular path or anything like that? 
I was sort of like that. I didn't have a particular path, but um, I really did want my art career to take off and, and it, and it never did fully. Um, I was able to sell enough paintings to pay my bills, but I wasn't like breaking through in the art world and becoming a known artist. Uh, and I came back to New York after being a few years in Mexico, um, ended up landing a show at a gallery in Santa Monica through some friends in New York, came out to LA in, I guess, 2007. And it was right at the beginning of the crisis, the financial crisis that my show happened. And for the first time, I didn't sell a single painting. Um, I did, however, fall in love with LA and move here. So I live in LA now, I live in Venice. And, um, and I spent the next few years really fretting about what I was going to do with my life. Um, like I was st getting closer to 30 and I felt really aimless and I felt like a big loser because my career that I thought I was going to succeed at with art wasn't really taking off. Um, and so I struggled a little bit with um, not knowing where to find inspiration or what to do and feeling like, Oh gosh, I don't have, I've gone to two, two different art schools and I don't really have a way to make money. That's um, adult. So Tracy, can we delve a little deeper on that? Because I'm sure a lot of people that are listening have gone through that, are going through that or will be going through that. Right. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed. I mean, whether it's at 29, whether it's at 39, whether it's at 19 or 25, at one point of everyone's life, they go through this, like, what am I doing, right? Am I on the right track? Mm -hmm. Do I, Am I inspired by what I'm working on? Am I passionate about this, right? Kind of go deeper, right? Like, what, what were some of the low moments during that time, and what helped you get through that? Or what did you do? I mean, what, what eventually got you through I, um, so the, some of the, to describe the, the struggle of it, uh, it was that I, I would truly sit, I had a studio, which was actually a storage unit in the apartment building that I lived in that I built out with lights, et cetera, to be a painting studio. Um, and I just, I couldn't get to work. I just look at a blank canvas. I'd, I'd rearrange the lights in the studio. I'd, listen to music and beat myself up for not having more better ideas. Um, I got uh, obsessed with cooking. So I'd kind of make excuses to avoid the studio, even though I had spent all my money and effort to, to get one so that I could finally paint in LA, I would then avoid going to it. Um, and then I would feel bad about doing that. So like a rut, you know, um, a lot of self doubt, like why haven't I broken through? What would it take to make it? Um, and then I think I was compromising um, in terms of being able to listen to my own voice about what would be interesting to create because I was so concerned about whether it would be um, a good contributor to a career path that I wanted, that I wasn't really able to listen to my own kind of inspiration. Um, and what got me out of it was, you know, not a... Uh, it, an, an unsexy and not creative thing, uh, which was that uh, my my ex, who I was with at the time, had an internet business that had done really well early on and then went through a really severe challenge period. Um, so the 2008 crisis hit, there was a cash crunch, they, they got sued and... Um, it was just him and a partner and they needed help. So I jumped in to help because I just wanted to feel useful. Um, and I felt like it was really satisfying to be able to do something where I knew I had done good work by the end of the day. So whether it was researching legal stuff or working with the lawyers or fixing the website, I was starting to pick up a bunch of entrepreneurial skills um, just to help him out of a jam. But then one day he looked at me and he said, you're really good at this. You should have a startup. Um, and I started thinking about shifting from 
my art dream into doing a business because I could get feedback about whether I was doing a good job. And that felt like a big relief. Yeah. And thank you for being so open about all this stuff and sharing those moments. Cause I, th- like Posh said, I think it's something that a lot of people probably go through, especially it's, it's no surprise. You know, you mentioned from a, from a young age, especially with all the health issues that you had, like you were very driven and ambitious. And anytime you're driven and ambitious, you set these really high goals for yourself and you have these grand visions of what you want to be. Right. Um, and anytime you're not there in whatever you're doing, it's a very, very tough thing to grasp. Right. It's like, I know, I know I have all these, all this potential. I know I believe in myself, but I don't know what to direct this energy towards. Right. And for you, you know, you, I mean, I don't know if this was like a realization you had before you started working with your ex's company and like, you know, getting involved there or what, if it was in hindsight, but were you thinking in terms of, I just need to do something and I don't know, I don't care what it is right now, but I need to start somewhere or did it just sort of, did you guys kind of like fall into that? Cause it's, it's, it, I don't know. It's kind of like a little paralyzing to be in that f- situation. Cause y- you know, you kind of talk yourself out of a lot of things, right? Because it doesn't align perhaps with what you think you're, you know, you want to be or, or do. Totally. totally. I think it was a whole like, uh, you know, there's all kinds of stuff involved in that, your ego and your self image. If you think you're going to be really successful or, or really successful at a certain type of thing, or that's your dream. Um, Letting go of it can really make you feel like it's like an identity crisis almost. Uh, I think that helping on my ex's business was a little bit of a, uh, it was soothing in a way because it wasn't, I wasn't taking on an identity or deciding to do a whole new thing. I was just helping out where help was needed. And I like to feel helpful and useful. And I liked to be learning about something that I never knew anything about and figuring it out fast and problem solving. Uh, And over, I don't know, about a year of doing that, I at some point realized I was enjoying it. And then that I had to maybe question whether being an artist was even going to be the career that would make me happiest because sitting in the studio and staring at the canvas trying to make something creative was was making me unhappy and solving business problems was making me feel really charged up and good and excited um and so so i did start to just kind of change my mind about what i wanted to do yeah and and you talk about identity crisis and i think it's something interesting there where you know like you mentioned growing up you might have this thing that you think you're going to be and you sort of label yourself as that or want wanting to be that and and you get stuck on that label for so long where if something just doesn't go the way that's planned that's when the identity crisis comes in so i think we need to like almost rethink the way we identify ourselves in a way right it's like you're not that label you're not your job or that particular thing like you're all these other things and whatever you choose to do you can apply those things to that right Oh, for sure. I mean, the whole idea, it's a, it's a, I think it's a young and a naive idea to like, imagine that you're going to be one thing. We're all so many things and life is so unpredictable. And it's actually probably a bad idea to lock yourself into an identity or a path early on or ever really, because you'll miss a lot of opportunities um, to make yourself really happy and do cool, cool shit. (laughs) So, Tracy, you know, you've now kind of settled into, you know, life in L.A. and uh, had this kind of maybe this like light shining through that maybe there's something else for me. Uh, what, what, what did that something else kind of happen pretty immediately? I mean, how was it a month? Was it overnight? Was it a year? Like, give us some insight into how this next life step came to be? Yeah. So, uh, let's see. I, um, I had had an idea for kind of like an art project that would be a universal closet on the internet where women could just all share clothes. And there were a lot of ideas and layers behind it, you know, like we should all be collaborating more and why do we, why should it cost a lot of money to have a wardrobe and why do I always want what's in my friend's closet and feel sick of what I do have. And plus I had been a big uh, like consignment thrift shop kind of person 
for a long time. And so the early idea for Tradesy happened around 2008, um, but it came in a in a fragmented way. Like maybe it'll be an art project, maybe it'll be a business. Um, I had also gotten married. I got divorced later, but I had gotten married then, and I thought. Um, gosh, this wedding dress thing is wild. It's this most expensive <laughs> thing you'll ever wear and you wear it once. Um, so what a good opportunity, like a great place to start, right? I, I had some friends who I was talking to about this great idea I had for a closet in the in, on the internet that we would all share. And they were like, yeah, that sounds more like a business. And also you should just focus really narrow, which is good advice for any early stage entrepreneur. It's like what super, super narrow vertical can you prove out your thesis in? Um, so mine became wedding dresses and I uh, started out in 2009 building the earliest version of what would eventually become Tradesy, mm. which was a first trading platform, then a buy and sell platform for wedding dresses and wedding items. And did you like know what you were doing? I mean, I, I assume the answer is no, but I mean, beyond, no. beyond, beyond, beyond the no, I mean, I guess I should have asked, how did you figure out to do some of the things that you had to do? I mean, you had to set up obviously a website. You've got to go through that you know process, ideally take photos, get customers. I mean, talk to us about like, the early moments because again like pat and i have done this we've interviewed now 200 people so you know we can kind of assume a lot of the answers that people give but i think what we try to differentiate on and what we really care about is what people feel like in those moments or kind of what they went through because at the end of the day i think for us a success story is if someone someone listens to this podcast tracy and says you know what i'm 29 years old um, or 25, whatever. I don't remember how old you were at that time, but I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm not, I'm not, I, I clearly am not doing what I thought I was going to be doing. I don't know how to start a business, but I'm going to give it a shot. And who knows, they become the next Tracy or they become the next person that's on this podcast. Right. So I guess to keep with that in mind, I mean, what were some of the things that you did early on? Um, and how did you figure it out? Hmm. Well, I like the idea that you focus on how it felt because I think that how it feels when you're doing it is uh, not necessarily a reflection of what's actually happening. Um, at least it wasn't for me. It hasn't been for most of the people that I know. Um, so I spent three years bootstrapping that business learning along the way every aspect of how to create a business on the internet. So from coding to design to um, customer service to uh, SEO, et cetera, uh, I was just teaching myself. I was teaching myself Photoshop. I was teaching myself CSS and HTML. I did have uh, an early mishap with an overseas developer lost all my money, had to regroup, had to hire a different developer, sold everything I owned, rented out my bedroom on Airbnb and slept on my couch, like really, really, really had to scrap to, um, to make ends meet. And I mostly made mistakes every step of the way and then um, would be concerned because I didn't have the money, the budget, the time for mistakes, and yet they would happen. Um, and looking back, at those three years, I was wildly succeeding at doing something nearly impossible, but it didn't feel like it. Um, and I was having fun and I was interested in what I was doing and I could feel that I was learning and growing, but the business didn't take off. It took, it, it did nothing for like a year and a half and then it started to grow and then it started to really grow. Um, and most people I talked to seemed to think that I was, you know, doomed to failure. Nobody seemed impressed. Um, there was no proof of success. Most of the things I tried didn't work. And so the feeling while you're doing it is probably not, especially in that zero to one phase, is going to be like, oh, shit, nothing's working. You know, uh, what, what kept you going? I mean, like, fine. It's, it feels like shit zero to one. I mean, like, shouldn't you be like, I don't want to do this again from one to two? Or like... In your head, you're like, 
I, I, I don't know. I don't know what's next. Like, I don't know what else I would do. Right, like, I want to know really what kept me going, and I think it's a like it's it's one of these blessings, and you have to look at it this way. I didn't have a safety net at that point. I had no safety net, so um, my like I I wasn't there. I didn't know what would happen to me if the business didn't work. I had put everything I owned into it. I was then um, splitting up from my ex. Um, my parents would always take me in, but it's not like, you know, there was, there wasn't like a super comfortable, like place to go to. I would, and, and so, um, it was sink or swim. And there were definitely times that if I could have found a way to quit, I would have. Um, and so in a way, like, you know, I'm, there were things about where I was starting off that were like, I didn't have certain, advantages, connections, safety mm -hmm. nets, all of that. But like, thank goodness, because I would have taken an out if I had had one when the going got tough and not having one was helpful. So maybe even if you have an out, pretending that you don't have one would be helpful because it is going to feel impossible a lot. You know, I think you kind of answered it. Um, but all these things you talk about, you know, trying to teach yourself how to code, Photoshop, like Airbnb, having to rent an Airbnb, like these things take insane amounts of discipline to do, right? And usually, you know, you, we kind of hear different types of founder stories, right? Like there's a story where someone is like really deeply, intensely passionate about what they're building. And if they don't build it, like, I mean, that's like they're obsessed about it, right? And they're like ab about the actual business itself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what it is like the industry or, or the solution to pain or, or what, what have you, right? For you, correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like, I mean, at the time, like you had seen this opportunity, but it sounds like it wasn't necessarily about the business itself as opposed to, I just need to make something out of this, whatever I'm doing. I just need to make something out of this because I have no other option right now. It was a little bit of all of it. Um, so, and that's another part of the kind of zero to one experience that's so challenging is that it's super schizophrenic, right? There were days, weeks, months on end in that time period where I was feeling driven by pure creative inspiration. Like I was so excited to see this thing materialize in the world and what it was going to look like and feel like and how people were going to interact with it. Um, and then there were times that I was so frustrated by all the limitations and failures that it really got in the way of that feeling of inspiration. And I would stop caring and feel like not continuing to go. And then the looking over the edge of the cliff was very helpful to put me right back on the mountain. Um, but so it was, it was all of those things, you know, I was super passionate about it. I was, I mean, I would stay up. Part of the reason that I decided to rent out my bedroom on Airbnb was because I was sleeping on the couch because I was learning to code and design and all about it. And I was so obsessed that I would just fall asleep on my laptop on the couch every night. Cause I, and I'd wake up and keep working because I was so excited to just keep going. Um, and so I had no, I never went to the bed and I was like, well, that that's a waste of space that I'm paying for. I could, I could help fund the business with that bed. And, um, so it was a little bit of all of it, you know, um, it was, it was all, all the things thrown together. I feel like I've thought about this. I've asked this, you know, to a few different people, but, you know, you hear stories like this and it makes you think like, is that the level that I need to go to, to almost, you know, ensure some level of success, right? Like not even above and beyond, but going above, above and beyond. Right. And, you know, I'm sure there isn't an answer, but I'm just curious to hear what you think about it. Because it just seems like borderline crazy at times when you hear stories like that. Like borderline, like why the hell would you even do that? Like, you know, why would you risk some of those things when the chance of failure is so high? Like something is definitely a little off. Like, you know, that, that I'm, not, I'm not saying that in a negative way, but just like from an outsider's perspective, thinking more objectively, you, you wouldn't advise somebody to do that. But oh, is would. that what it takes? I mean, like, is that what it takes? Oh, it's such a tough question because um, I think we should live in a world where that isn't what it takes, right? I don't think that we, I, I, the amount that I worked in the first, let's say, five or six years of my business 
was unhealthy, <clears throat> um, crazy, um, like very, took a huge toll on me and I don't recommend it. And so I wouldn't want to say that in order to achieve outsized success, you're probably going to have to take it to like level 10 crazy. Um, and yet, you know, it does seem like to get extraordinary results, you have to go to extraordinary lengths. And I don't even know if like, would I do it all over again? I don't know. Yes, no, all of it. But really, it it's not for everybody and it shouldn't be glamorized. Um, I My nature was always to be like, I'm a little bit of an obsessive artist. I my my work is my life. It drives me. I can't not be building stuff. It's not um, like how I choose to be. It's sort of <clears throat> it's sort of how I came. And um, so so yeah, I think it takes some unnatural or unusual choices to do this. And I don't know that it's for everyone, and I don't know that it's um, worth pursuing if you're if you're not um, really, really, really invested in the lifestyle and the outcome that it leads to. Right. So, kind of moving on a little bit. Um, I know you said you bootstrapped the business for a few years. You started with wedding dresses, and obviously, at some point, you pivoted into kind of everything. Um, when I guess a few years into it, what sort of happened where you decided, all right? Um, I can't be bootstrapping this anymore and we need to move into other things. Like when did that moment come? Hmm. I mean, I was, I kind of became aware like a year in that there was this thing called a VC and I was supposed to be meeting them and that to build a bigger business, I would need more money than I could make, um, you know, babysitting and side hustling. And um, I tried really hard to make connections with people who could angel invest. Um, it took me a really long time to get there. And then I met a woman named Danny Levy, who had been the founder and CEO of a site called Daily Candy that was sort of the first super viral content site for women on the internet. Um, and she somehow was kind enough and to believe in me after one meeting. And she gave me $25,000, which felt like a fortune at the time. So much more money than I had ever had in one place at one time. Um, and that was helpful in getting sort of my, that, that was the beginning of building credibility enough to get into a room with the next person and the next person. And then I got into an incubator program um, called Launchpad, now defunct, but the guy who ran it here in LA, a guy named Sam Teller, went on to be Elon Musk's chief of staff for a long time. Um, so he was doing Launchpad right before that. And he let me in kind of by the skin of my teeth because I didn't meet all of the requirements for the incubator, but he like had a good hunch about me. <laughs> and, um, and that really uh, was... I would say one of the big milestones that changed the trajectory of things getting into the incubator program. And as the business started growing, um, obviously you have to start hiring people and it, I don't, I don't know, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but you had never been in that situation where you're managing, you know, all these people like how did, how was that experience for you, uh, becoming a leader, becoming a, a manager of people and, and, uh, navigating that? Yeah. I had never even worked at a, at a company. Um, <laughs> let alone been somebody's boss at more. I mean, I had managed, I was the manager at a bar. Um, but um, yeah, that part was, it's challenging. It's always challenging. And, and I had to learn all the norms. You know, I asked in my first interview ever, uh, and I, the first question I asked was, um, oh my God, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, that was 2012. That was our first engineering hire ever he was right out of college and he's still with the company so he's been with us for nine years he met his wife at the business um she was a designer with us for a long time they have a baby so that worked out okay but um i am um, i i had a lot i had a steep learning curve to become a manager and a leader of people but i it became a real passion of mine um i 
care a lot about the people that I work with, like a lot, maybe to a fault, um, and always did. And so hopefully um, my inexperience was made up for with effort and like real dedication to learning how to be better at that. Um, so I guess aside from that, you know, maybe particularly for the business itself, like, did you have any other challenges that you had, you faced like early on that, I mean, you just had no idea you didn't anticipate would happen. Um, or was it, was it something that little by little, like you saw it growing and you just knew what you had to do? Um, and that thing out of nowhere kind of came I mean, we had a, we had a few moments that, that really accelerated the business in, so I would say that early on after the bootstrapping phase, once we raised our first round of financing, which was like $1.5 million of seed money right after the incubator program, um, we had a few huge opportunities. Like I got on Good Morning America in the middle of Hurricane Sandy for like six or seven minutes, um, national TV, captive audience. I was the only one crazy enough to try and get into New York City in the middle of the hurricane. And I did it and got the airtime. And it just, the, the business just took off from there. Um, and we never looked back. And so there was a phase of early hyper growth that um, was really cool, really, really cool. Um, and, and came with all the usual challenges of, of hyper growth, but that's what we call high class problems, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I was never, uh, I, I, I was never fretting too hard about those because those are problems that you're lucky to face. Yeah. So, you know, I've read several places that, you know, within the first few years of trade Z, you guys were already a multi million dollar company, um, which, you know, is very difficult to achieve in a lot of companies even now. The only way they achieve it is by raising multi-million dollars, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're valued at that number. Um, you know, besides these, you know, let's call them whether they were lucky breaks or big moments in the business. What was it? I mean, there was clearly product market fit. I mean, clearly people liked what you were doing. Um, how can others perhaps do some of the things that you did or, or identify some of the opportunities that you did in their business uh, in the first few years? Yeah, I, I, there is so much to the idea. It's a little trite, but it's true. There's so much to the idea of stick, stick to your guns, like stick to your idea, unless you have proof that it's wrong and then you pivot, but don't stop. Like it, the name of the game is getting more at bats. And what I did right more than anything else was keep getting up to bat no matter what. Um, so, you know, all the, when I look back, all the lucky, all the lucky breaks we had came out of a hundred attempts to find a lucky break and then one broke. Um, so obviously you need to have some fundamentals in place. You have to be doing something that people want. Uh, your product has to be reasonably good um, and all of that, which is, you know, those are separate podcasts each in, in and of themselves. And I certainly don't have all the answers to those things. Um, but I think anyone who looks back on a path where things went well and tells you that they were that it was because of all the stuff they did might be delusional. Like there's a lot of luck and timing involved. Mm -hmm. I had a good idea at the right time. That's probably important. I worked really hard and didn't stop. That's also important. And so, you know, try to try to replicate both of those things. And then if you're doing all of that, uh, a lot of it is just don't stop hitting mm -hmm. until you hit it. All these things you said now, I a hundred percent agree, but did you know those things when you started? Because you sure sound like you just naturally knew those things as like common sense almost like, I mean, because they are, I mean, they're not revolutionary ideas. It's just like work hard, keep doing it, keep getting reps, like keep going on. I think people complicate common sense and they just try so many different things and it just kind of goes out crazy. But did you know that going into it? I mean, or, or is it something that you've learned over time? I think I knew from, um, from my health issues 
right? That so that and that's why I like I talk about that now more than I used to, because I think that the reason that I had that kind of tendency to keep to get up and fight, get up and fight, get up and fight was that um, when I had gone through health challenges when I was young, that was that was what got me out with better outcomes than the doctors predicted. So it was a habit I formed really young, which was, you know, get knocked, get knocked in the stomach and keep getting up, you know? Um, and that turned out to be the key ingredient, I think, you know, more than anything. It's not, it's not intelligence. It's not, you know, like there's, the, it, it was like the ability to get knocked down and get back up uh, over and over and over again really served me well um, in every way, like all throughout life. Um, and it's not to say I don't take it hard when I get knocked down. I do, but um, but I still get up, you know. So um, I don't think I knew that that was going to be like the, the key to, I was just nervous that I wouldn't succeed. But so I didn't know. I wasn't like, I'll definitely do well if I just keep getting up. But I knew that that was kind of a prerequisite for for anything and that that was how I was going to live. Yeah. Um, kind of talking about the industry in, in, in general, um, what were some of the hypotheses you had about just the fashion industry going in early days, like early days of building tradesy and sort of just like seeing what, you know, um, I guess factors, uh, you know, you come across and building towards that. What were some of those hypotheses you had and which ones ended up coming true and which ones didn't end up coming true? Ah, good. Now, we're at the fun part. I like talking about the business more than about myself. So great. Okay. So I had a few hypotheses that came true on a really grand scale, which is extremely satisfying. Um, so I knew that, um, that most women um, didn't have the budget to afford the wardrobe that they wanted. That seemed obvious to me. I didn't need market research to tell me that we all would like wish we could spend 10 times more than what we had to spend to get stuff to wear that would make us look and feel great. Um, and I knew that there was a lot of uh, what we now call dormant inventory, right? So stuff in people's closets that they weren't wearing that could be sold. Um, and I knew that women weren't buying and selling on eBay. Um, I didn't know all the reasons why. Now I know all the reasons why. And it's also changing. But back then, uh, you didn't, women were not, women make or influence 85% of all consumer purchasing decisions. But eBay was mostly male, um, which is a weird thing for a commerce site, a multi category commerce site. So I was like, the solution out there doesn't work for women. That was a hypothesis that, that seemed really true for me. And um, so that was my gut. I was like, there's not, and, and then we had just kind of gotten into the mobile era and I was like, there's a supercomputer in everybody's pocket. I walk into my closet with it. I have a hunch that we could build the ultimate, um, consignment store slash, you know, exchange, uh, on this little supercomputer and that every woman who currently shops will sell. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, that was a hunch that I had. And at the time, less than 3% of women in the United States had ever bought or sold something pre-owned online. Today, that number is over 50%. Mm -hmm. So we've gone from a super fringe behavior to a predominant behavior in the time since the initial business thesis. Um, Do you think that that, in part is due more to the younger generation or let's call them millennials, Gen Z, Gen Z, X, whatever, uh, being more environmentally conscious, uh, conscious, excuse me, and just being against this whole idea of fast fashion and the waste that it creates? Or was it more than that? I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud because for me, that seems to be a big issue. But for others, it may just be, hey, I like vintage clothing. Like I like what my great grandmother wore, and I want to replicate that look. Yep, it's gone through uh, various phases since the kind of inception of this online resale category. Um, early on, so the first name for, of Tradesy was Recycled Style. 
wah, wah. nobody liked it. Everyone was like, that's a clunker. Get rid of that and get rid of it because it's long and cumbersome, but also get rid of it because nobody cares about recycling style. That's not um, exciting to people. And our data and market research at the time, so early years, you know, call it 2012 to 2014, was like, 2% of our market cared about sustainability and 99% cared about getting a discount on Louis Vuitton. And so we built a, a brand or a platform that was really focused on delivering the very best price on pre-owned designer and luxury brands, uh, authenticated pre-owned designer and luxury brand fashion. Um, and that was an irresistible value proposition for our customers. Did they know or care that they were doing something sustainable? Maybe, maybe not. That all started to change a few years ago. Um, Gen Z, so, or the coolest generation, I think, um, much more uh, environmentally and socially conscious than my generation was, um, much more aware of the harm and the toll of fast fashion and disposable consumer goods on the planet and on people. Um, and so the reasons people shop with us are shifting. Um, but listen, when you've got Louis Vuitton at the lowest price around, plus you're doing something good for the world. Um, you know, it's kind of a win-win. Right. Like, yeah. But what do you think happens, like, in terms of the entire industry? Because there's obviously these brands and, you know, people who, who want to make money, I guess, creating clothing. And then there's this consumer side where now it seems like a bigger part of that consumer base is uh, fully hope hoping to have, like, some sort of circular economy. Like, um, how does that work? Or how do you see it working out? I mean, I think it looks a little bit like a revolution that consumers create with their choices. So the more and more people shop and sell resale, the more pressure is put on the primary market, the brands and the manufacturers to create high quality, highly desirable goods that last, that can have more than one owner and that have a long lifetime because my customers now, they still go out to the mall, they still go to retail, but instead of buying any old thing, wearing it a few times and getting rid of it, they're looking for things that they know they can resell after they wear them. So I think what happens over time is that the secondary market grows, the primary market shrinks, and the winners in the primary market are those who create high quality, sustainable goods with good business practices and durable products. Um, and that's why we focus on the luxury tier of this category. It's not because we love Gucci. We do love Gucci, but that's not why we focus our business in this luxury part of the, of the category. It's because it's an act of like, it's, it's, truly important to create a more sustainable world that people stop buying disposable junk and like just fashion alone not even all durable because just fashion accounts for 10 percent of all carbon emissions on the planet like we could hit our climate goals just by not buying disposable crappy fashion anymore yeah if i'm not mistaken it's like the second most polluting industry in the world after oil or something like that right yeah it's somewhere in the, it's third or fourth it's hard to it's there's uh, agriculture there's oil and gas and then there's a couple of other categories like fashion that compete for third place uh depending on which data you look at yes mm -hmm. you know uh, one question i had um you know with any marketplace business there's this whole chicken and egg thing right of you know you want to have the inventory uh for people to come on and shop from but then uh you want to have people to buy certain people's inventory otherwise you're going to stop posting it on there so how did you how did you overcome that in the in the beginning like uh, how did you what did you did you tackle one versus the other before or yeah yes uh it started with, um, so first of all, we've never overcome it, meaning uh, balancing supply and demand is still one of the kind of core jobs of, of my team as stewards of our platform. Um, and it's always changing. It's always dynamic how, how you do it. There are always new techniques and ways. Um, but early on, we really simply went to a bunch of consignment stores and bought five 
thousand items and listed them ourselves out of my living room to seed the platform um, and have the first batch of inventory. Um, it was we we used that first um, venture capital financing, like we took a chunk of the money to do it. I found it very, I was, I mean, terrifying, right? It was like my first big risk. I think we spent a hundred thousand dollars and it felt like, um, felt like a lot today. Now we've sold like, I think it's now well over $1.5 billion of pre-owned fashion. So looking back at that initial investment, it was very tiny, but like my heart was in my throat with all that inventory sitting in my house. Basically, I'm curious, how many times have those items that have been bought on your platform been resold another time or another time? Do you guys track that? Like, let's say I sell this stupid example, but the shirt I'm wearing and Pat mm-hmm. buys it and then Joan buys it from Pat. Like, is there a life cycle of a piece of clothing or item that you guys sell? There is, although it's it's noisy data um, and it's incomplete data because the average time in between buying and reselling is something like three plus years. Mm-hmm. So we have to look back at like years way past just to get an indication. We think that that number is somewhere between 10 and 15 percent today mm-hmm. uh, and has the potential to increase. But of course, there are also a number of ways that people engage in resale now. Right. And we don't, we don't know. Right. A lot of the things that are sold on our platform were actually bought pre-owned from other sites as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, and as long as it's recirculating, we're happy. Right. Although we do have, I'll, I'll promote a feature. We have an easy relist button and a wait list function. So if you buy something on Tradesy, it'll still appear on the site to buyers who are searching and they'll get on your wait list. And so mm-hmm. like if I bought this sweater on Tradesy and I want to wear it for a year, when I come back to sell it, I just hit a button and chances are there's somebody already waiting to buy it. Mm-hmm. Would you say that most of your personal closet now is pre-owned stuff or? Oh, yeah. I always say, um, except for socks and underwear, it's all pre-owned. <laughs> um, yeah, totally. So, um, and I haven't really had to, other than like a couple like occasional things for appearances or whatever, I haven't had to spend more money on my wardrobe in a long time. So. Right. I sell what I'm not wearing, and with the proceeds from my sales, I buy the next thing I want. Um, so if you can sort of get to a baseline closet that has some value built into it, then you can just start recirculating, and it's like having an, a revolving wardrobe that's perpetually free. Right. You know, just to kind of kind of wrap things up, I know, Posh, if you have one more question, but um, we talk about gen z and kind of the next generation and and the mindset there when it comes to uh sustainability and and especially in the fashion space but consumer behavior in general is such a hard thing to like change especially in something that has been the same for generations and generations and generations of going to the store and, and going to these brands and buying new clothing and then when you're done just throw it away or maybe donate it um hopefully um so I guess what's it going to take? I mean, is it just going to be something that from generation to generation, obviously it sounds like it's going to get more towards that, but is there something that needs to happen now or could happen now that could potentially drastically change the way most consumers think about clothing? Yes, I think yes. Um, and, and it's, and it's a big part of what we work on. So, um, so the question is how easy is it to sell? the things you own, right? And I think that what we've been working on at Tradesy for the better part of a decade is making it really, really easy to list and sell the things you own. Um, But it can still get even easier. And some of the technology and the products that we've been spent years building that are still not even released to the public are going to make it as easy to sell something that you own as like, let's say, posting on Instagram, right? So envision um and we're, we're not very far from this that i'll be able to walk into my closet snap a photo of the thing i'm no longer wearing computer vision identifies exactly what it is it matches that product to tradesy's proprietary database of all the products in the world it tags it with all of the necessary information as well as a fair market value price i as the seller just say cool i'll take it yeah that's right it's you identified my 
my shoe. And sure, I'll take that price for it. Now our algorithms know exactly which buyers are in the market for that exact thing and that size at that price. We match that product with the buyer. It liquidates and sells. A shipping kit arrives at the seller's door. All they have to do, drop their item in a box or bag, leave it on their doorstep. When so, so all in, I've sold something I own. I've made the best money possible. I've gotten the most optimized price. And it's taken me, you know, a total of three minutes mm-hmm. from end to end all of my effort. I think when selling is that easy, everybody will sell everything they own and it will fundamentally transform the way that we think about commerce and it will unleash literally trillions of dollars of value that's yeah. sitting in people's homes and closets and, and, and that can really turn things upside down. Absolutely. And I think that's like the, the, the part of it that is like reducing the friction of this whole process. Um, yeah. But I think there's something that comes before that, which is like the desire to even want to sell your clothes and, 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 and uh, buy, you know, use clothing, like, where is that mindset shift going to happen? Is it just going to be through word of mouth? And, 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 you know, like, because there, 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 we see a lot of things coming out, like, obviously, news pieces about pollution and what's going on there. And, and we don't know if that's making any difference in people's um, mindsets. Hopefully it is. But do you think that there's something in that area, like the step, the step before that, that people can do? Well, I really hope that the information that's being provided to us from climate scientists is influencing people to make different choices. But I also think that we, myself included, have these very limited human brains where comprehending the enormity of something like climate disaster and then tying it to like your everyday shopping choices can actually be hard to it can be really hard to make that connection um and so i think what's more likely to shift that mindset i think it's already shifted quite a bit so we have the momentum and the trend is positive that towards people being more open to buying and selling pre-owned um i think it becomes social norms that start to Uh, You know, we're such social creatures. We're so influenced by each other. Uh, What makes something desirable to us is often that we see a bunch of other people desiring it. And so I think that as we see um, more and more people buying and selling pre-owned, influencers and celebrities are an important part of this. Like we shouldn't trivialize that. It's important to have influential people modeling this behavior. Um, I think that helps to create the change it, that just, and, and so it's part of the mission and the responsibility of our, of us and other companies in the category. We're not just building for-profit businesses. We have to educate consumers and transform behavior um, and if we do it, we'll win financial prizes, but we'll also win impact prizes, which I think needs to be at the core of building these kinds of businesses. Tracy, I'm sure we can sit and talk for hours and hours on it because you have a beyond interesting story and beyond interesting insight into you know this industry and, and the future of uh, commerce and fashion in general, right? Is and hopefully we can do that at a future, you know, event or something once the world completely normalizes and uh, we can be face to face again. But, you know, just want to thank you for your time and, uh, you know, sharing and being super, super transparent. I think, honestly, you know, you almost know, at least me and Pat, like, you know, after doing a couple hundred of these, you immediately know which stories are going to be just so well received by our audience. Um and yours is definitely one of them. And I don't, I don't say this often. I mean, if you listen to the end of every episode, I don't say that. Um, that's not to say that other people don't have great stories, but I think that yours is one that when people listen, they're going to actually want to do something about whatever situation that they're in in their lives. And I think that that's why we started this podcast was to hopefully impact one person. Right. And I think that people have been impacted, but um, your story is definitely an inspirational one. I think it's one that continues to be inspirational. Um, and that's why I hope we can do this again. 
Thank you so much. You guys are doing great work. Um, bringing, I think bringing these stories to people who are on the journey or considering the journey is um, super helpful and important. I, I didn't have enough of these stories when I was coming up, but I had some and they all stuck with me. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so thank you for the opportunity to hang out and chat and I look forward to, to doing it more in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you guys.